Hi and welcome everyone to the discussion session in physics of the examination JE main that had been asked on 10th April 2019. I am going to discuss the paper of the morning shift in this particular setting. All right, let's begin. Now to begin with the first question, say that has been set from the topic of rotational motion, a very straightforward question, a regular happening in the class. Moment of inertia of two disks has been given as I1 and I1 by 2 and I1 having an angular velocity omega 1, I1 by 2 having angular velocity omega 1 by 2. They are brought in contact and eventually the two disks acquire a common angular velocity. Yes, brother friction which is responsible for that. And after it attains a common angular velocity, I need to calculate the loss in kinetic energy. The question specifically says the difference in total energies, but it's very clear when I say total energy, it is obviously the kinetic energy given this particular situation. Right then, so if I start with the solution part, the angular momentum is conserved since torque about the central axis is zero. Individually, friction is acting on the two disks, but the torque being equal and opposite, eventually the net torque becomes zero. So by the concept of angular momentum conservation, I1 omega 1 plus I1 by 2 omega 1 by 2, that's the initial angular momentum and finally that's going to be I1 plus I2 multiplied by omega dash and that I2 is of course I1 by 2 which is straightforward the moment of inertia will not be changing. Okay with this data we'll calculate the value of omega dash. So you know the initial angular velocity, you know the final angular velocity and kinetic energy can be calculated which is half I omega square. So all you need to do is that you find the difference between the final total kinetic energy and the initial kinetic energy. You solve it, you would land up with option number four. So option number four is the correct option of question number one. Let's move to question number two. Here is the second question that has been extracted from ray optics. You could say that there is a ray of light and it is incident on the vacuum glass interface starting from vacuum going to the glass. The angle of incidence and angle of refraction is very clearly shown which is 60 degree and 30 degree respectively. Together this length has been given, this is A, this is B. And on the basis of this information, I need to calculate the optical path length. So basically there are two path lengths, one is the geometrical path and other is the optical path. So if I say mu is the refractive index of any given medium, then a geometrical path of T will have an optical path of mu T, that's an equivalence, the geometrical path to optical path a very simple fact that we use very commonly in the lectures of ray optics. So the first thing I require is I need to calculate the refractive index and I hope so it's not a difficult one on the basis of this I can see that 1 sine 60 that's root 3 by 2 I'm just snelling around is equal to mu sine 30 which is 1 by 2 so I could get here the value of mu is root 3. That's the first piece of information. Second, if I talk about the geometrical path length first, let me calculate AO. Let me go with the geometrical path. Well, this is A, this is 60, so this path length would be A upon cos 60 and that is going to be 2A. Likewise, here this is B, so this is also B and if I go with OB, I just want the geometrical length, this thing. 
So that will be A upon cos 30, and that is 2A divided by root 3. There you go, everything is done. The refractive index has been calculated. The geometrical path has been calculated. Now, if I want to calculate the optical path, as I've already said, a geometrical path of T is an optical path of mu T if the refractive index of the medium is mu, right? So here, the total path, if I see, this would be as it is because it's a vacuum one. So that's going to be 2A plus if the refractive index is mu, that will be mu times this length. And mu is root 3, so root 3 times this, that will be 2B. So this is the optical path. And you see that 2A plus 2B is exactly matching in fourth option. So correct option for question number 2 is option number 4. Let's go with question number Three. Question number three, it's from kinematics and it involves a bit of integration. However, at this level, once you are thorough with all the calculus skills, this again should not be a difficult one. Now, let's say a ball is thrown upwards with an initial velocity v0 from the surface of the earth. The motion of the ball is affected by a drag force, and this time, the drag force is something like this, m gamma v square. So different from the regular feature where the viscous force or the drag force was taken directly proportional to v. So this one is something different, and will not quarrel on that because much of the viscosity question is empirical based. And even leaving apart all those things, here, it's a question of kinematics, and we are not at all interested about the cause. Whatever is the data given, we just rely on that. We make a mathematical calculation. So just think, we need to calculate the time the ball takes to rise to its zenith, the wonderful word, the extreme, the highest point. Effectively, the question has asked about the time of ascent, and there, two forces are acting in the downward direction inherently, gravity plus an additional one we got. So if I talk about the retardation, that is of course gamma v square plus g. So this comes out to be dv by dt will be equals to g plus gamma v square. And since the speed of the ball decreases with time, Quite obviously, I need to put a negative sign here. And now, it's just an integration, and that too, an integration of a very standard known format. It's not something very unexpected or peculiar one. That's the case. And let me plug in the limit. At t equals to 0, the speed was given to be v0. At t equals to ta, let's say, the ascent time, the speed is 0. Now, this is such an easy format, in fact, a format which is a very close acquaintance to every JE main aspirant, A square plus X square form, where you could say that X is this and A square. So quite obviously, when you solve this, you would be getting option number three as the correct option. Fine, now it's time to move to the fourth question.